I'm the new thing with a bright smile Catch me when I'm out in public Always show them love and I know they love it Give you a reason to love me this season I'm taking my chances, I hope it enhances my Welcome to America's Podcast, today we have on uh, William Weller How's it going, William? It's going well Good, good So, um, yeah, I have you on because you were my surgeon for my thumb yeah. And I actually haven't really told really anybody about it <laughs> So, um, yeah, I... This was August... I want to say 16th or something like that. Uh, my dog attacked me. Uh, have, do you know like the real story? Did I tell you? Uh, I know kind of the quick snippet version, but yeah. I don't know all the details. Yeah. So it was actually a really weird situation. Um, so I was going to Full Sail University online, just taking classes through music like that. And um, I was just doing my homework in my room. And uh <laughs> My wife comes home. She comes home around, it was like eight something at night. And then she's just um, coming in. And I was like, let me go hang out with her and the dog. So I stopped doing my homework. And and then I go out there, hang out with them on the couch. And then I'm just like hanging out with RJ and like touching him or whatever. And then I'm like, all right, let me go back to doing my homework. I get up and he just like attacks me, just like runs after me. And it was it was so weird, but I say it couldn't have happened at a better time because so I, I work Sunday through Thursday mm-hmm. and it happened on a Thursday night. It was late Thursday night and um, we leave. We go to I can't think of the name of it. It's in Bartlett, yeah. the little hospital there. And then I go there first. I'm there for probably like maybe an hour, two hours. And then that's when the ambulance takes me to the other hospital. And then I'm there all night. And then they say, the one doctor that can do this, he's usually not here, but he's here right now. And he said he'll do it in the morning. I'm like, perfect. Worked out well. So, yeah, it just so happened to be you. So what was was that situation? Um, uh, So, I mean, so I cover kind of hand call uh, down at Region 1 Health. And basically myself and a few of my other partners – if you have a hand injury and you come in and it needs taken care of, uh, we take care of it. You're for you. The stars just aligned. It was, yeah. it was, uh, I was there and we got to get you taken care of quick and, and, and early. But, um, yeah, we get a lot of, uh, it's not an uncommon scenario, uh, your type of scenario. Um, it's, uh, I take care of a lot of dog bites. I mean, some, some really devastating, uh, injuries sometimes. Um, but a lot of times we're able to do things and get people back to full function. Yeah. So, um, do you always work at that particular hospital? You jump around? No. So, um, I'm, I'm a part of Campbell clinic orthopedics, which is based out of Memphis. We've been here pretty much longer than anyone ever okay uh willis campbell was the founding orthopedic surgeon it was founded in 1909 um really before orthopedics was a subspecialty he was kind of one of the early uh uh, subspecialty pioneers um so he founded his clinic which used to be uh, downtown memphis uh and he was affiliated with um what was called the crippled children's hospital at that time Mm -hmm. took care of a lot of uh kids with you know, polio, growth deformities, um, traumatic type stuff. And then uh, uh, with the start of that, he also started an orthopedic residency where you train the next generation of orthopedic surgeons. And so that also, that whole process was in its infancy um, of how to train our subspecialty doctors. And from that, uh, yeah, over a hundred years of orthopedic trainees have come out of our clinic, we're, we're now affiliated with University of Tennessee. Mm. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a, we're a, we're a big operation that we have subspecialists like me who do hand surgery. And then my other partners, Fred Azar's a sports medicine doctor covers the Grizzlies. Barry Phillips covers Memphis. Um, we have a joint surgeons that are great. So putting in total joints like uh, Patrick Toy and Jim Guyton. And then uh, we've got oncology guys who are t- 
taking care of bone tumors. Uh, and then we have a whole wing of therapy and, and uh, uh, even non-operative physiatrists uh, that can help you, you know, if you have an irritated nerve root, an injection, those type of things. Um, so in that whole kind of company, we, we uh, also cover ERs and call and stuff like that. So um, it's just a way to, you know, take care of people and spread our footprint print as best we can to, to, you know, people like you in your scenario, you get sent to another hospital where they don't have, uh, that subspecialty coverage, then you can get in touch with someone like us. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it's quite an experience I bet. Yeah. I was a little upset because, so when I got to the, the Bartlett place, um, you know, I came in there calm, and I was trying to be as calm as possible because yeah. my wife is just freaking and out. It's a scary experience, yeah. Yeah, like, after after it happened, she's just, like, shaking and freaking out. I'm like, calm down. Take me to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she's driving me there, and then uh, we get there, and I'm just like, I just so happen to have a bandana in the car. So I take the bandana, and um, I, I picked up my phone when we left the house. Yeah. And then I, I put that, I think I put that in the bandana, and then I also just, like, wrapped my finger up and just was holding it yeah and then i get to the counter there's some kid who like i don't know what happened but he was like holding his eye i think he got his eye poked out that night (sighs) and then um so i'm just like standing at the counter just like waiting and then uh the kid you know they get out of the way and then um she's like um hey uh, what's going on what happened i was like i got my thumb bit off and then she was like wait what and i was like my thumb is bit off and she was like hold on, show me. And then I was like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she was like, Oh my God, come through the door. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, I got in there and they ended up giving me, um, some drugs to like, you know, calm me down yeah. nerves, all that stuff. And, um, I think I'm sitting there for probably 45 minutes, maybe an hour and they're taking care of me. But then they said the ambulance was like on the way and I was like, all right, cool. And I think I sat there for probably like 30 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And they said they were on their way like a long time ago. And I was like, look, if they don't come in like the next five minutes, I'm just going to leave and yeah. drive myself yeah. to the next hospital. Yeah. And um, they are like, hold on. So they call and the guy's like mad, like, how come y'all aren't here and everything? And he said, the guy's going to leave. And I was like, all right, what's going on? And he was like, uh, they, they said they'll be here within like next 30 minutes. Yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> so another hour rolls by and they finally show up. And yeah. I was like, all right, whatever. So that's when we end up leaving and getting to the other hospital. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, it's it. The experiences often with transfers and stuff like that are just, there's just, uh, it's always hard. You know, this guy, those first responders and whatnot are, they're being pulled everywhere and probably one second they think they're going one 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 place and then boom something more uh, urgent pops up and yeah I, I wish I could say uh, sometimes my surgical schedule is all laid out and then something comes in that just has to be dealt with at that moment and and that pushes you know things back and it's just it's just the nature of uh, nature of the field so how do you do priority wise um, you know it's just like any other uh, uh, assessment, you know, that you'd have in hospitals or probably wartime or, uh, just the urgency of things, survivability, like life threatening. Yeah. Life threatening. So obviously life threatening is most important. And, uh, you know, region one health is that is the place that they, if you have a life threatening traumatic injury there, that's what they do excellently. And so you come in and you have a life threatening, you get fast track, Mm. straight to whatever you need um and then below that is limb threatening um you know scenarios where people have blood vessel injuries and they need their blood vessels repaired open open fractures or broken bones that need to be washed out so you don't get deep infections stuff like that so um the the various subspecialties just work in concert to figure out right what needs to go first, second, third, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, okay. So, Have you ever been dragged, like, during a surgery? Like, they're like, hey, by the way. Uh, no, usually in that scenario, they'd call in another surgeon. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, luckily, um, uh, that's, u- that's usually how that goes. Mm. Um, 
or things are just as you experience there's always a little bit of a a build up in terms of getting people to the point of evaluation or or uh to the hospital yeah sometimes so um yeah i mean it's a uh it's a complex but well-oiled process for the most part yeah i mean we've been doing surgeries for as long as we've been able to yeah. as humans so yeah. i mean whether, whether you had anesthetic or not back yeah in the day. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i guess they did what like some moonshine or something just to get you drunk and- yeah they used to use uh they i mean they used to use alcohol and the the uh skill of a surgeon was uh, judged off of how quick they could do it mm-hmm. and then um the uh courage of the patient so they had to you had to have uh, both on board and then uh, early before anesthetics um it was actually a uh, medical culture uh, supposedly was or surgeons in, in specific took it as an insult that you needed anesthetic because <laughs> it questioned their speed and skill wow and, and then uh with the advent of development of things like uh, ether and whatnot, mm-hmm. actually dentistry pioneered anesthesia uh, mm. before really what you think of today as surgery. Okay. And yeah, we, a lot of things in medicine come from dentistry first. So, uh, bone in, orthopedic implants, um, bony ingrowth in orthopedic implants, like joint replacements, came from uh, de- discoveries in dentistry. Hmm. My, my father's a dentist, so he reminds, oh, really? he reminds me of that. Okay. Yeah. So is that what got you into becoming a doctor, was the fact that your father was a dentist? Um, yeah, I'd go on medical mission trips with him, uh, and uh, those were always eye-opening. I worked with him, and then my, my best friend's dad is an ear, nose, throat surgeon, so I'd work with him. And uh, there were uh, OBs, podiatrists, just uh, uh, general internists, pediatricians. So I got to kind of see all that. Um, and then I loved science when I was in high school. I was, and uh, uh, so I, that kind of got me in that direction. I kind of knew pretty well in high school that I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I just didn't know what kind. And then uh, went to college, majored in science or uh, biology and chemistry. And then... Uh, went to medical school and then I got into orthopedics because orthopedics is, uh, um, usually it, uh, attracts people with a athletic background, um, because it's musculoskeletal based. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you see a lot of sports injuries, you know, I take care of a lot of sports hand injuries, you know, things like, uh, Drew Brees injury where he tore the the main ligament in his thumb, Mm. do things like that. And, um, uh, or torn elbow, elbow <clears throat> ligaments, or what a lot of people know as Tommy John's yeah. type surgery, those type of things. Now, isn't that, is that the surgery where, um, baseball players get it a lot? Yeah. It's a very common in baseball players. Yeah. Um, I've heard they get it on purpose sometimes so that it like helps yeah. their throwing motion. So hopefully not. Uh, <laughs> that. uh it, that's a little bit of a, I don't know if that's like the urban myth yeah, it's, type it's, thing. It is a bit of an urban myth, but um, it's a misunderstanding of the data to to think that if you have an injury that you do, that you'll repair it and that you'll actually be better. Oh. Um, but the 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 real data is that the the people who underwent a Tommy John surgery back in Tommy John Tommy John was a real baseball player. Um, who had that uh, uh, reconstruction, and he did he did return to a higher level of play than he was before. Oh, um, okay. And there's there's some studies that show that people do return to a a, a, a high a equal or somewhat higher level of play. And some of the thought behind that is you know they they were potentially chronically injuring that elbow until a point that it failed, so they were underperforming um due to the nagging injury and then you re- you reconstruct them uh they rehab appropriately and then they're able to uh increase their velocity and um so uh, yeah sometimes you, people will 
say, well, if it hurts, just re- reconstruct it because yeah. then I'm going to be better. <laughs> Not always the case. Hmm. And no one bats a thousand. There, there are complications. And uh, so it's not always as cut and dry as, as yeah, I'm just going to just just give me my robo arm. <laughs> so do you see, speaking of robo arm, have you seen any type of new technology in the medical field that you just foresee that it's going to make leaps and bounds for medical research or medical uh, practice? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, yeah, so I deal with upper extremity, uh, hand, wrist, elbow stuff. Uh, or injuries, and um, they have these uh, myoelectric prostheses. They're very expensive, um, uh, but they're they're not yet at their you know perfection. But it's really fascinating some of the stuff they can do. So if you had a transradial amputation, um, th- they can make you a custom made prosthesis that's a hand with gears and levers in it, and you do surgery and and put nerves in certain areas on the uh, remaining forearm muscles and uh, with where each of those nerves go it creates a signature based off the muscle emg which is like Mm. a electrical kind of signature signal signal that comes out from that nerve connected to that muscle Mm -hmm. so that signature gets made input a input b input c input d and so the patient can think you know flex my wrist and it fires that muscle and if you assign input a to closed fist the prosthetic hand will close their fist Mm. and then you let's say you assign input b to open fist so the patient thinks you see their muscle ripple a little bit and then it'll fire that that implant and so you know they can pick up a pen, put their hand here, grasp the object, drink, put the object down. It's not as seamless, obviously, as yeah. our hands. But, I mean, it's it's significant for someone who who doesn't have uh, something like, who, who has nothing else. Yeah. It can be a good helper hand. So that stuff's fascinating. And I'm sure just with time, you know, you'll they'll be able to put, you know, processors in there that can eventually make uh things more fluid and and lifelike but the the those are amazing they have uh uh, digit uh prostheses for people who have amputations back here that um uh, are driven by the adjacent joints those are uh, pretty fascinating um a lot of this stuff comes out of uh the military with all the uh you know war injuries there so they have um, crazy stuff, osseo-integrated prostheses where you implant a bone, or you implant um, a metal kind of connector into the bone. It comes out of the skin, and they can connect their leg prosthesis into it. So it, it's literally attached to the skeleton. Wow. Which gives us more feedback, it's more durable. Um, that's like at the that's at the pinnacle of, you know. Yeah. Walter Reed Hospital and the guys coming back from Afghanistan and whatnot. But it's, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. And a, a lot of early technologies come from the military. Robotic surgery came from the military, stuff like that. Yeah, I actually have stocks in this company. I was just doing some research on companies to buy stocks into. And, uh, you know, technology companies were at the top of my list. And uh, there's a company called Rewalk. I think it's Rewalk Robotics. Hmm. And, I looked into them and the stocks were pretty cheap, but I was like, all right, let me buy a few stocks in them. And then they did a reverse split. So I was like, when I saw it on my, my phone, I was like, oh no, what does this mean? Cause I didn't even know what that meant at yeah. the time. So when I saw it, they ended up giving me, I think I had 20 something shares. And then I ended up getting like a hundred and a hundred and something shares. And like my profit just went way up and I was like, Oh, this was a good reverse yeah. play, <laughs> but their stocks ended up dropping dramatically after that. Huh. And, but right now it's going back up. Huh. So I'm getting back to where I was yeah. when uh, they first did the split. Yeah. But what the company does is they make like the, um, it's basically like a, I don't want to say it's a bracket, but I think it's kind of like a, 
like an attachment to legs. Mm-hmm. I, it might be for paraplegic people, mm-hmm. but it's it's kind of like an attachment to help people yeah. um, move better and uh, use their legs in a better function. And it and it was um, a like a military contract that yeah. they got. And then once I saw that, like their stock started going back up, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, they get that military those yeah. reps in that practice, so yeah. it helps out. Yeah, that's that's uh, fascinating. I mean the. There are vets that get back to full service with amputated body parts. That's I can't imagine how much uh, hard work and courage that takes. Yeah. Uh, but thankfully, we have people like that. Have you ever thought about going into the military as a doctor? Um, I did. I I thought about it briefly um, in medical school. Um, I actually was going to go into the military out of high school. Oh, okay. Um, so I was raised in the military. My parents were both officers in the Air Force. Um, and my brother's, um, he's an a Army Green Beret uh, currently um, and pre- had previously served in the Air Force. So I was going to graduate high school, go into the military, do four years, and then um, go, go to college afterwards. But I got denied for... Uh, medical reasons I, I have the most mild form of psoriasis which hmm. is just a benign skin condition but yeah. at the time they that was something that disqualified you so you should have lied like my friend yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's what everybody said yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um, that's what everybody said actually so I try to get in the Air Force then I try to get in the Marines Army and they just they're like no 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 oh man so um so then I went to college, and it, you know it's a blessing in disguise, I guess. Um, I'm very happy in, uh, to be where I am, but I mean, it would have been uh, that was something I, re- I really wanted to do. Um, and then it came back up again when I was in medical school. I thought about uh, joining again, uh, but the same issue kind of arose, and I didn't want to fight that battle or hmm. not or fudge some paperwork. So yeah. Um, this is a, I mean, this is just the path that God chose for me. And it's, I mean, it's great now. I get to help in a different way. Um, yeah. And, uh, um, yeah. So I'm fortunate in that manner. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's like a running, I guess, joke that people use for doctors in the military. They said they couldn't cut it outside. (laughs) So Uh, it's, it's kind of funny, but at the same time, it's like, uh, they might've just came in by choice. Like they might've just wanted to be in the military. No, there's some great, I mean, some absolutely superb uh, military docs. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was a medical student, I worked with some guys that uh, I was in San Antonio, and they they're, they come over from the, the military orthopedic program and work with the, the c- civilian orthopedic program. They were phenomenal. Um, one of our resident physicians is he's signed up to do the military thing after his residency oh okay. he's a he's a great resident um physician and will 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 be a superb orthopedic surgeon um we've had we've had uh military guys come through our training program too and uh um so yeah we're we're really uh everybody loves military guys because they're gung-ho and <laughs> smart guys yeah so um now it's it. I, in my experience, it would. Pro- I would say it's the the opposite. There's, there's some of the most committed, hardworking, smart guys out there. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that there's something that's maybe lacking in the medical field? Maybe I don't it, whether it's education, uh, funding, or personnel. Is there something that is truly lacking that you would like to see advance? Um. Uh, you know, everyone, especially as a surgeon, you always want more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, there's just there's so many places you can go there. For awareness, like for me, in hand, you know, f- firework hand injuries around the Fourth of July. It's just it's it's. I've crazy. heard that's out like up just ridiculous. How many people get yeah injured during that? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a real kind of health issue. Um, I'm a member of the American Academy uh, uh, of Orthopedic Surgeons and then the uh, uh, American Society for Surgery of the Hand, and, which is the ASSH. Um, the ASSH has kind of a, a, a whole thing about firework hand injuries and firework safety. and um, So obviously awareness about that and then 
through the AAOS, which is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, um, they have um, uh, other kind of public awareness um, programs about ACL tear prevention, um, which has been shown to be uh, beneficial, especially in female athletes doing proprioceptive training and hmm. kind of, you probably have done them like plyo, plyo yeah. boxes, stuff like that. You're saying that's more common in females? Uh, yeah. If, uh, well, if you, it's been shown to help them uh, prevent ACL tear in oh, certain okay. studies or lessen the risk of ACL tear. Got you. Um, so things like that. Education, of course, is always key. Um, so having people that can help push that uh, is extremely helpful because as a surgeon, you only have a finite period of amount of time that you can spend and then you need to go see and talk to more people about surgery but there's still some some other nuances that could be you know picked up by a, a counselor and, and discussed with the patient kind of to help optimize them as best we can um, so at, at our at camel clinic we, for example joint surgeons when the, before they do a total joint now we actually send them to pre-therapy. So they, they go to therapy before they get their surgery. Um, and that actually educates them, informs them, and, and really what's called activates them to, after surgery, they're not just sitting there saying, I've been operated on, now I don't know what to do. They actually know the next step. They know the do's, the don'ts. And uh, it's made a big difference in, in a, a total joint replacement to the point now 10, 15 years ago, it was a three-day hospital stay. Mm. Um, now uh, you can do, you can get a total joint the same day. You you limp in in terrible pain. You walk out feeling great. Wow! Uh, it's it's amazing. Um, so, uh, yeah, education um, resources are always uh, hard to come by. Um, especially when you're at, at centers that, you know, get the brunt of the transfers or just the brunt of the traumatic injuries. Um, you know, you, you can always use more operating rooms, uh, just to, to help people. But, uh, um, uh, yeah, those type of things. What do you think is the, um, I guess the big difference? People always say that, uh, Canada, as far as like their their medical is um, is pretty good for it to be free, and mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, well, you get what you pay for. So yeah. <laughs> you want free medical care, you're going to get that free status where you wait for forever yeah. instead. So do you think America's? You think it's the system is okay or? Yeah, so I think you kind of make a good point there. You get what you pay for type of an idea. Uh, you know. Every health system has probably things they do really well and other things they don't do so well. Um, in Canada, yeah, if you there's a set number of dollars set aside for a total joint replacement, and once they exhaust that, total joints are shut down for the rest of the year. Cool. So they may, yeah, so they may run out of it, um, you know, in July. And Jesus, yeah, and so five, you know, five more months. Oh of, my God! If someone says, "Well, we were going to do you, but we're going to have to push it off till next year," which for uh, elective surgery is is not always elective. Usually, that only means the time period in which you're going to elect to put it at a time that works for the patient and you. But if you have a horribly painful joint that um, you know is is you're living with constant pain, which probably affects you emotionally. Um, and then also physically just getting around, uh, which, you know, if you can't move, you, can, you gain weight and all the adverse health effects from that. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, you just, uh, you just gotta do those type of things. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think America's, you know, we're doing what we can with what we know. I yeah. mean, it, we've only been around, you know, 1700s. So, yeah. I mean, but the technology and as far as medical wise, you know, having hospitals, having some sort of emergency service with transportation, yeah. like all that stuff, it it's it's kind of hard to just prioritize people. Like, how right. do you prioritize a human being? You absolutely can't. And yeah. and the good thing is, is those systems, even the, even the the 
individuals who are on the you know fringes of society um if you come to the hospital you're going to get taken care of if you go to x hospital which has not a lot of resources because they're in a small community um they you you get transferred to a, a hospital if if deemed necessary to get your issue addressed um uh yeah with the with this with the socialist model um there are pros and cons i mean uh if you you know if you're suffering with joint pain and and you want a joint in, in the u.s you go see a joint surgeon and if it's indicated you get a joint yeah other places not like that you know canada you can you're just gonna wait a long time yeah um and somewhere like for example cuba you're probably not ever getting a total joint. <laughs> oh man! I, I mean, I don't know that. I don't know that. Yeah. One hundred percent. But you know, the points you make, advancements in medi- medicine, they usually come out of the U.S. Mm-hmm. because the model is built to pioneer. Yeah. Just like we do with a lot of other things. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's. I, I feel like that is America's staple as far as capitalism wise. Like yeah. we let money drive technology and advancement yeah. and that it's helped it's worked <laughs> right. and it's all about you know the engines of economy are good when they're tinkered with appropriately they shouldn't be completely unbridled but you got to find that right mix to innovate and help people and keep people healthy um but not you know create some uber wealthy cr- class and and that's it so yeah. um yeah it's it's everything's in moderation um, so, uh, yeah, I would obviously choose American healthcare, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but I'm heavily biased. <laughs> <laughs> so is there something that you feel like, um, you feel like you maybe wish you had knew like when you first started doing your practice or, um, is there something that you feel like you just, you know, you can take it now and then continue with or, um, you know, it's it's called a practice for a reason. You're constantly learning. Um, I think I, even starting out right after med, medical school, you you just are constantly learning how to talk to patients and really hear what they're saying. Um, because what, what 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 sometimes we miss as surgeons is we know we know this we know your pathology and we know the surgery you can have and what we deem as um a good outcome but that may not be the exact same thing as what the patient wants so you really have to listen to that patient and you know you're talking to them about their hand and you know their complaint is um i want my i want my hand stronger Mm -hmm. and what you're thinking is okay i can do this surgery it may not make them stronger but it may may help with the pain yeah and for them, if they go into that surgery thinking, um, I'm going to get my hand stronger, and I go into that surgery thinking, all right, we're going to eliminate the pain, but, <laughs> but the strength may or may not come back, you know, three months, fast month, fast forward three months later, your, bo- both your expectations were off. Yeah. Because it wasn't discussed kind of, you didn't come to that consensus on the front end of saying, look, the pain is going to help a lot. Or this is going to help a lot with pain, but I can't guarantee you the the strength recovery. That patient may may or may not have made a different different decision, or at least would have been more prepared and and expectations would have been set better. So for me, just hearing kind of those nuances and saying, "What do you?" Oftentimes, I'll ask patients, "What do you What do you want out of your hand or wrist or elbow?" Mm-hmm. What, what if you had to say one thing that you really want to get out of it? And once they tell me that, I can then kind of drill down on well here's what surgery or no surgery could offer you um, with potential odds. Yeah. I mean, as a surgeon, you're like a master of a language and that language is recovery. Yeah. And the everyday person is like a, like a child just learning and they're like just trying to figure out the right words to explain to you what yeah. I want. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's gotta be difficult. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, uh, on my side of things, my job is to kind of explain your injury to you offer you options educate you about it as much as possible 
and then make a help you make an informed decision um, as opposed to being really patriarchal and being like you need this all right <laughs> uh, because that that's for some people that works but I think in I think that worked yesteryear mm-hmm. but in today's society people want to people want to know and people want to um, they want to for the most part be engaged in their care and and if you can if you can get them to be activated and to participate in their care um, that's great like someone like you you had an injury um, you you, you got it fixed and then you pretty much went you you just knew to you were going to you were going to get back to it yeah and that's a huge part of it is that is someone having their their own kind of go getter at attitude mm. um yeah i didn't uh, skip a day at work yeah like that happened on as i said it happened thursday night and i was back to work on sunday and i just everything that was suggested to me. I did it. Yep. You know, I didn't deviate. You know, yep. a lot of people will get a cast in their arm, like, "Hey, don't get it wet." They're swimming the next day. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just like, "Let me just do yeah. what they tell me to," because they're the experts. So. Yeah, especially with hand injuries, the the sooner you can get back to function, the, the the sooner you can get that finger bumping into things, so it doesn't hurt forever. The better. Yeah. Um, there's a, a fascinating paper written in the, I think the, 1980s of uh like 130 surgeons who lost digits including whole thumbs um some multi-digit index fingers uh and middle fingers wow and uh only three of them retired from operating which is it just (laughs) it just tells you that in the mo in the in someone who's highly motivated um almost no matter the injury almost no matter the injury they can they can uh, persevere yeah um so as long as they understand the rules of the game and 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 what to expect moving forward like the people who lost a lot of their thumb instead of you know when you operate with instruments you kind of use these two fingers there's there's another way you can hold the instruments called palming the instruments Hmm. which is actually easier to hold the instruments because you don't put them in the rings and so they there were some of the surgeons said they're actually better at their job <laughs> uh, that's funny because of it so it's all in the eye of the beholder um uh the patient the patient's motivation is is a huge component as well interesting yeah uh so i know you got to get out of here uh it's already been um, about 45 minutes so. <laughs> no problem um, is there anybody that you think of that I could have on that is in your field or something like that, or somebody you would suggest that yeah. I would have on? Um, yeah, I can, uh, I mean, I've got a whole bunch of partners I could ask. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can come to kind of talk about their field if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or, uh, I'm trying to think who else. Um, yeah, I've got, I, I can, maybe some buddies in anesthesia or something like that. Yeah. That would work. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. we can, um, you can, I guess you can just send me an email sometime. Yeah. and I'll, I'll ask around and, and, and see if someone would be interested. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, it's been great having you on. Yeah. I'm glad you came by and uh, yeah. we have to do it so, again some other time. Absolutely. <laughs> have some other people on. Good. All right. Well, uh, thank you for everybody tuning in and uh, see you next time. Hey, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the podcast. And if you would hit the subscribe button, the subscribe button allows you to, well, subscribe to the podcast. And if you give me a like and give me a comment, well, that would help out as well. Commenting allows you to have a conversation with me and liking it allows me to know that you actually like it. And if you dislike it, hit the dislike button twice. That's a real help out for me. So comment, like, subscribe, and let's keep it rolling.